Linoleum was invented in England in 1855. The name comes from linseed oil. It's like a, a, sort, a sort of adapted from the Latin uh, linseed, which is lin, and oleum, which is oil. So it was uh, dried linseed oil. Uh, initially, the inventor thought it would be like a, you know, a construction material like uh, India rubber. But in the end, it, it became used with a, with a sort of rope backing for a floor covering. Today, uh, what we call linoleum, uh, if you can't buy linoleum, it isn't linseed oil anymore. It's, it's a kind of acrylic um, compound. Uh, the, the using linoleum as a printmaking material begins with a group of German expressionists in the very early 1900s. Uh, this group were called De Brucke. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrongly. Uh, De Brucke is German for the bridge, uh, the bridge of the emotions. And they originally were using linoleum to cut wallpaper designs. And uh, obviously that was a, a quick jump to to use an for actual imagery. I, I, I wish there was some sort of great legendary story about somebody having to make a, a wood block print in the middle of the night and there was no wood left and they thought, oh, maybe I can use this linoleum, but there isn't one. It would be great if there was. Maybe there is somewhere, uh, we'll find it somewhere, but um, it's like, yeah, we can, we can make portraits with this as well. This is by one of the De Brucker artists, Eric Heckel. This is Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. Uh, Kirchner, you, you may have heard of us, uh, uh, and they, they uh, Carl Schmidt Rotloff, uh, and these were all the De Brucker artists. So, and uh, I'm trying to, like, you know, because this is the kind of thing we want to do, the history of art is a history of men making art. So uh, the more contemporary 20th century printmakers, I'm trying to, you know, emphasize uh, women printmakers. This is uh, British line of cutter, Sybil Andrews. Uh, again, sort of multiple blocks. Uh, Irina Sibley, an Australian printmaker. See so these uh, Australian animals like a kookaburra, kangaroos, and a, an opossum. This is Claire Layton. This gives you a very sort of detailed kind of uh, images of the uh, circus. And you see how very fine and, and what sort of delicate grades sort of value you can get with lino. This is Gaga Kovanchuk. I, I think he's Russian. I mean, who's, what's not to like about a, a, an artist called Gaga Kovanchuk, another uh, mid-century mid uh, German line and cutter. Again, multiple blocks and another one by her. This is uh, Lustal, is a comic artist, French comic artist. And I don't know who that is, but again, I love it. I love the image. Fantastic work. I love the details there. Helmi Chufonen. Native American artist. Uh, this is amazing. This is a British lino cutter. Her name is Gail Brodholt. Uh, she does a lot of prints of the uh, London Underground, the tube. Again, multiple blocks. I, I can't begin to count how many blocks there are here. And again, the same there. It almost looks like a gouache painting, but it's a print. So um, I'm just going to turn now to, to my own work for a little bit and just give you some idea of my process. So uh, this is from a book I'm, I'm working on at the moment called Moon Dog. It's about a dog. So how do I do it? I begin with a sketch, which I usually uh, Xerox and print out. So it's the right size to fit to a block. So this is the, the printed sketch. Generally, I buy this what's called Battleship Grey Lino. I don't know, was it originally uh, ordered for the Navy to put Lino in their battleships? Who knows? I, uh, maybe it was, but it's grey. It's, it's very inexpensive easy to come by and, and is very predictable. So this is like an eight by 10 inch block that I'm gonna cut my design on here. I lay the uh, Xerox on top, then I put uh, trace down paper underneath, trace it off with a ballpoint pen that doesn't work. Very valuable tool in, in printmaking and also in bookbinding as a, a ballpoint pen that no longer has any ink in it. So it acts as a kind of, it's a really nice stylus. When I've got the design traced down onto the block, I begin cutting and I have various shapes of cutting tools that I cut between the white lines. I cut away the gray, leaving the white and I keep going until my desk is covered with little flakes of linoleum, sort of get into everything. 
and I have to vacuum up. Uh, here, I've rolled the black ink over the linoleum block, and I've taken my first proof in black. Um, and from this point on, in this particular print, I used it to produce the second color. I used, I used the second block, the same size, to register it all. That's the, that's the color now, it's blue. And then I added the second color there. And then that was, that's gonna be an illustration for my book. Now a few, few of my own prints here. This is my Mother's Day card, which is kind of spurious because I no longer have a mother this year. Um, but, you know, I kind of thought it'd be nice to do one in memory. memory. And uh, my wife, Lisa, thinks that um, her mother comes back in the form of a ruby-throated hummingbird, which I think uh, they're not unusual on Monhegan Island in the, in the high sun. It's a night heron and an oyster catcher and the owls. And finally, this is a, a Eurasian kestrel. As you see, I'm trying more and more layers now and methods of getting more and more layers using very limited colors of ink. This is uh, four color blocks. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, so I just had a few questions. All the work of the show is actually already online here. There are like 50 pieces in the show. It's, there's a lot of stuff. So rather than go through it all, you can just go and check it out. So this is, I guess, for both of you. Was there an inspiration for this Monhegan Birds show? I don't know what specifically it was, but, you know, we both were showing our work on Monhegan for the last few summers. And I'm a big fan of Asher's artwork. And we both seemed to be doing a lot of imagery of birds. So it just kind of seemed like a, a natural fit for a show to do something together. I and mean, we, we like spending time together. And, um, you know, I like to see my birds hanging out with his birds as well. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's more just like a, a reason to do something together. And, you know, Graham's been really good to us in the past and had some really lovely shows there. So it seemed like a nice place to uh, take our work. Is birding a hobby of yours outside of art making? Yeah, I, I, was, I was a bird nerd from about the age of nine. I was in, uh, in the south of England out in the countryside with my dad one Sunday morning and he, he pointed to a, a brown bird. So it was like, you just think of British birds as the average brown bird. And he said, oh look, there's a kestrel hovering. And it sort of felt like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, these birds, they're all brown, but they, they have names. And um, from that moment on, I became very fascinated by birds. So I was drawing birds. Um, I, I kind of started collecting a load of bird books. And I, I was pretty fascinated by it right up uh, into my 20s. Like a lot of the time I was at art school, I was, I was drawing birds. And then I, I sort of got into like, you know, drink and drugs like every everybody at art school and <laughs> other, other stuff and I, I stopped and then um, I saw uh, Dylan's wonderful beautiful uh, picture book of his paper cuts in, in the uh, Lupin gallery uh, I guess uh, you know about four years ago and I thought, wow this is great you know and then I sort of thought, oh yeah this is a great opportunity to start start making bird art again and so yeah, I've been doing birds, I suppose, for the last four years or so, sort of getting back into it, relearning. I started painting and drawing and then and eventually moved to doing prints. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think that, you know, like if you're a birder, there's that zero-sum game when one minute you look at a bird and you think, oh, what is that bird? And then, you know, it seems like the next year you're wandering around with a three-foot-long lens on your camera uh, getting up <laughs> at five in the morning. Um, so I, I resisted that and uh, I, I had to keep resisting it because it's very tempting to sort of think, oh, I would love to photograph that bird that's kind of like, you know, flying 200 yards away. And, you know, I need that three foot long lens to get anything other than like a, a tiny dot in, in the frame of my camera. But I, I just, you know, I try and look and I identified birds and Monhegan is just, amazing for its range of bird life especially in the, the spring and fall and I, I love the raptors um you know and they there's you know i don't know six or seven species of raptor that are fairly frequently seen on monhegan um, not including the owls there's owls as well these are the daytime raptors like hawks and falcons and eagles so that's it
Yeah, I, uh, that's that led me into making both art. So my answer would be uh, more succinct. Basically, I'd never considered myself a birder until about four or five years ago when I had the opportunity to do the, the artwork for the Everyday Birds book. And once I started working on that book, I really started to look at them with a different approach and a different, I saw them differently just because I spent so much time working on the birds and I continued to do a lot of bird paper cuttings after I was done with the book and I continued to do them today still. Um, but especially being on Monhegan in the spring and the fall, like Asher said, it's just, it's impossible to not become somewhat of a birder because they're just everywhere and they're so amazing. And it's definitely, you know, become a part of my life where it wasn't before. So I think most people know about Monhegan, but can, can one of you describe a little bit for someone who's never been there? Uh, Monhegan is about 10 or so miles off the coast of Maine, mid-coast Maine. So it's like if you're in Portland, Maine, you go another two hours north of that and then get out on a boat and it's an hour out to sea. And it's a little island with about 50 or so people year round and lots more in the summer. It's a, it's, it's a big um, tourist driven island with a few hotels and restaurants and shops. And there's an amazing population of artists there and there has been for over a hundred years. So it's just a, it's a really inspiring place to go and and just be around all this art and these working artists and such a great um, community and really supportive community of people that, you know, I just, I wasn't doing a lot of art myself until I started working on Monhegan in the summers. And I was just, it was something that I just couldn't not do because um, it's just such a big part of the environment there. One of the questions I, I had was, do you, do you get a greater variety of birds and I think you're saying yes on Monhegan or is it that you just don't notice them more because it's quiet and and easier to kind of notice them or do you know if, or is it is, is it in a spot that gets a lot of a, a big variety of birds yeah I mean it's, it's it's on a sort of migration route so birds many many species of bird are on their way through heading north in the, in the spring up to Canada. You know, and most, most of these migratory birds don't actually stop in Monhegan for more than a few days. So they, they arrive and then they're gone for the most part. Um, and then they were heading back down south in September, heading down to South America or Mexico. Uh, wherever their final destination is. So it is sort of like, a, sort of like an ornithological soap opera. You know, it's like, oh, who's, who's here today? You know, and that's why you get these, these uh, you know, large groups of, of birders coming out there. You know, you can see all, all kinds of species of birds that you're really not going to see on the mainland or you're, not, you're less likely to encounter on the mainland. Um, you know, it's sort of like uh, the snowy owls arrive, I think, in January, February. Um, they eat all the muskrats and then they leave. You know, so it's like they, they come and go. And they're, they're, they're daytime owls, so, you know, they're, they're very visible, they're big, they're quite dramatic. A lot of the birders are really into warblers. I think there's perhaps 40 species of warbler that pass through wow. uh, Monhegan. And I, can't, I don't recognize any of them, although a couple of them like the, uh, there's a blue one and a bright green one. And I, th I know, you know black-throated blue warbler, black-throated green warbler. I, I would recognize one if I saw one. I've never seen them, unfortunately. There are tanagers, scarlet tanagers, there are orioles, there are uh, indigo buntings, like almost tropical looking birds. Well, I guess they, they kind of are tropical because they, they winter down in the, in the northern part of South America and, and head north. I'm probably completely incorrect about that. Some <laughs> It sounds like you know what you're saying, so that's... <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I would also add, too, that there was, um, that as far as noticing the birds on Monhegan, the, the fact is that most of us are just walking down the roads rather than driving around in the cars. So I think yeah. the fact that you're walking around in the roads, um, you're, more, you're more likely to notice the birds around you.